tonight, dozens of Canadians finally make it out of Gaza. I'm happy I'm going to Canada, but my heart here. Relief and fear for those still trapped. And marking one month since the brutal attack on Israel, survivors forever changed. Did you feel that way before October 7th? No, you can't feel safe, no. We break down how attitudes have changed. Another passenger who uses a wheelchair injured on an Air Canada flight, this time struck by a lift and caught on hidden camera. Sorry, we, I haven't used this machine in probably seven years. A CBC Marketplace investigation. A healthcare report card. I think Canadians might be surprised. From life expectancy to access to doctors, how Canada measures up to other countries. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. For the first time since the war began one month ago, Canadians who were trapped inside Gaza have been allowed to leave. And here they are, arriving in Cairo by bus at nearly 5 a.m. local time after making the long journey from the Rafah crossing. Global Affairs says in total, 75 people with Canadian ties were able to get out of Gaza. Hundreds more remain. Tom Perry is in Cairo for us tonight with more on those who've made it to safety and what they've left behind. One step closer to safety. Crowds on the Gaza side of the Rafah border waited their turn to cross into Egypt, among them Canadians stranded for weeks as war raged all around them. We are under war and we are under attack and you know my home is fully destroyed. With packed bags and passports in hand, they're finally getting out with both relief and regret. I'm happy I'm going to Canada, but my heart here is with my family, my friends, they all died. I got over 30 friends I lost. My family, I lost over 20 people in my family. My cousin, I lost just a couple of days ago. Some, like Mohammed Sharif Al Hussein, forced to make an agonizing choice. His young family on the list to leave, his elderly Palestinian parents ineligible. As I was in such a difficult situation to choose between leaving with my own family, small family, and leave my parents behind. 80 Canadian names were on today's list from the Palestinian Border Authority. But Global Affairs Canada has been in contact with 600 Canadian citizens, permanent residents and their families in Gaza seeking assistance. We're going to continue to work day and night uh, until all Canadians and their families are out of Gaza. This is a priority for this government. But some are calling on Canada to do more for those still stranded and more to end the violence. Enough is enough. It's embarrassing that even uttering the word ceasefire is too difficult for our Prime Minister. Canada has called for a humanitarian pause in the fighting to allow more aid into Gaza. But the war continues. With Canadians and others anxiously awaiting their chance to get away whenever that comes. So, Tom, those 75 people who did make it out, what's next for them? Well, the Canadian embassy here in Cairo says the Egyptian government's only giving foreign nationals 72 hours to get out of the country. So those Canadians who arrive today will be spending tomorrow doing paperwork, getting ready for the next leg of their journey. And for those Canadians who didn't make it today, well, Global Affairs Canada says it's going to be contacting them in Gaza to make sure they get the help they need to get out. All right, Tom Perry in Cairo for us again tonight. Thank you. The Israeli military says is now fighting Hamas in the heart of Gaza City. As the ground offensive intensifies in the north, more civilians are trying to flee south. But as Susan Ormerson shows us, their journey is also a dangerous one. Just a four-hour window to go south, out of Gaza City, but they had to trudge. Some led the way, waving white flags for protection. It was so scary, she said. We saw tanks on both sides. We held up our hands and kept walking. 
the Israeli military pounded the north again, with troops, it says, already in the center of Gaza City. But the south is hardly safe, say those displaced. Multiple airstrikes again, this one in Rafah, as rescuers frantically try to find survivors. They said it's safe here. There's no safety at all, he says. A lot of people are killed. There is a growing loud clamor from the UN and neighboring Arab countries for an urgent ceasefire. But Benjamin Netanyahu rejects it. No ceasefire without the hostages' release. The Prime Minister did nod to what might come after in Gaza. Uh, I think Israel will, for uh, an indefinite period, will have the overall uh, security responsibility because we've seen what happens when we don't have it. But any reoccupation would be strongly opposed by the U.S. In the far southern tip of Israel, near Gaza, roads are deserted, guarded by soldiers. Normally, this is the last southern crossing into Gaza. Karom Shalom, down this way, it's closed. This road leads into Egypt, and Rafa crossing is right down there. Yeah. Yoshi Dayan's family runs an avocado farm here. When Hamas militants attacked, they had to evacuate for a month with two of their farm laborers, Sompong and Prawit from Thailand. Half of the avocado crop was lost, too ripe. They're trying to catch up on the harvest. This will not happen. I think we need a no man's land, a very wide no man's land. Impossible to, to believe that you can be neighbors. Diane confesses she used to be on the left politically. She swung hard right. The Jews will always live in one hand with a book and in one hand armed. Will you stay here? I hope we, I can. I hope the army will allow us a quiet life. But with the distant sound of explosions in Gaza, that future is a long way off. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, in Dekel, Israel. A national day of mourning was observed in Israel today to mark one month since Hamas's deadly attack. That's Tel Aviv, where a candlelight vigil was held. People there calling for the return of those who were taken hostage. Israeli officials say more than 240 people are being held captive. Another 1,400 were killed. A little later, we'll speak with survivors of the attack still coping with the trauma. And here in Canada, a synagogue, a nearby Jewish community center in a Montreal suburb were attacked overnight with Molotov cocktails. The remnants of glass bottles along with burn marks could be seen this morning. The Montreal police say arson and the hate crime units are investigating. No one was injured and the damage was minor. But it comes as members of Quebec's Jewish community say they've been seeing a rise in anti-Semitism. So if you're asking how the Jewish community is feeling, they're not feeling so safe. And I think there is a lot to be done by our politicians, by our leaders, by leaders of every community to say that this is not acceptable behavior. Montreal police say there have been dozens of reported hate crimes and incidents against the Jewish community since October the 7th. Now let's turn to a CBC Marketplace investigation showing a very personal view of just how difficult it can be for wheelchair users to fly in this country. As Air Canada representatives get set to meet with federal ministers, Travis Damraj shows us the hidden camera video raising questions about staff training and passenger safety. I've been in a wheelchair my whole life. Marketplace followed Alessia Di Virgilio and her support person Erica Katzman. Hidden cameras rolling from Toronto to Charlottetown, then back on Air Canada. Part of my disability affects all my muscles. And so as a result, it's difficult for me to breathe. People are separated from their wheelchairs to fly. We document the tube connected to Alessia's ventilator being briefly disconnected during a transfer. And this. It's oh, oh, sorry. Oh, oh, you okay? Oh, it's her face. Air Canada workers struggle with a lift. Please, guys, please. It's not from here. But even this, it's supposed to turn. Oh, there we go. See. The lift tips and hits her on the head. <laughs> it's really, really hard to watch. 
It's extremely hard to watch. Jeff Preston is an accessibility advocate. Do you think that Air Canada needs to up its training regime when it comes to staff? Absolutely. Air Canada wouldn't comment on Dee Virgilio's specific case, but did say they reached out to her to apologize. It told Marketplace the vast majority of passengers with mobility needs travel without issue. And in those relatively rare instances where barriers were encountered, we moved quickly to address concerns. The Minister for Persons with Disabilities is Kamal Kara. These are real people that say that they feel like they're an afterthought. They want action and they're not seeing that. Let me first reiterate that's absolutely unacceptable. And do we need to do better? Absolutely. After showing the minister our findings, the federal government is now summoning Air Canada here to Parliament Hill. That meeting is scheduled for Thursday. Travis Danraj, CBC News, Ottawa. So that's just one part of Marketplace's next investigation, Access Denied. It looks at how accessible public transit, taxis, and ride shares really are. You can catch it Friday at 8 p.m., 8.30 in Newfoundland on CBC TV and CBC Jam. Canada's transport minister commented today on another CBC News investigation about a man who died after suffering a medical emergency on an Air Canada flight. The pilot did not divert it. I offered my condolences to, to, to the family. Um, they're grieving, it's a difficult moment. Now I know Air Canada has, has to follow different uh, steps and procedures and that's, that's up to them to answer to that. Harish Pont died shortly after landing in Montreal nine hours after the emergency began. Air Canada says its crew properly followed procedures. The federal government announced today the latest step in its plan to address the housing crisis, promising to build more than 2,800 homes on federal properties. In order to get more housing supply and to have those homes built faster, we need to have cooperation across the whole country. The Liberals are calling on all levels of government to work together. This latest announcement puts Ottawa back on track of meeting about 29,000 units by 2029. At least 20% must be affordable. In Edmonton, two people are dead after fires at tent encampments. As Julia Wong tells us, there is growing concern for people living on the streets as the temperature drops. Trying to stay warm in the cold is a reality Aaron Sharphead knows all too well. Some of us do use open flame to heat, heat our houses. Because at the end of the day, these are our houses. These encampments is, is our houses. Over the weekend, a 54-year-old man and a woman in her 20s died after two separate tent fires. A third person was taken to hospital with burns after another fire Monday. Sharphead worries he could be next. Every day, every time I fall asleep, it's the last thing on my mind. You guys need any supplies, water, granola bars? For those working with homeless people, the deaths are not surprising. You try to tell them to keep their fires outside, but when it comes down to, you know, whether they're going to freeze to death at night or just be frozen overnight, um, they're going to do what's going to, it's easiest for them to do in the moment. All around, signs of people using whatever they can to stay warm. Advocates warn the number of deaths could grow. We're in a critical situation right now and we will see more loss of life. There's no doubt about it if we continue on the path that we're on. Police say they're worried for those living on the streets. The frustration piece for the Edmonton Police Service is the fact that we really want people to be safe and we want people to engage in the resources that are provided. Our number one goal is to help save lives. Local and provincial officials say help is coming. More shelter capacity is coming on board. There's other supports available, but this is a crisis that uh, is beyond the capacity of the city to, go, uh, to, uh, to manage. Our long-term plan is to continue to build more housing, which is why we're investing $9 billion to create affordable housing. Alberta has been experiencing mild weather this fall, but winter is coming and temperatures will plummet, and there's anxiety that will make a bad situation even worse. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. Canada's Environment Commissioner is calling out the federal government, saying it's falling short of its target to cut greenhouse gas emissions by at least 40% below 2005 levels by 2030. Canada is the only G7 country that has not achieved any emission reduction since 1990. Well, I agree with the Commissioner. We need to do more. We need to do it faster, and that's exactly what our, what our government is doing. 
The commissioner found the Liberals' plan lacks specific timetables or targets for various programs and that the most important measures had not been prioritized. The federal government says it's still working on new initiatives. And there's some new insight tonight on how Canada's health care system really measures up against other countries. It turns out it fares pretty well. Christine Birak shows us what's working and where Canada is falling behind. How does health in Canada stack up against dozens of other mainly high-income democratic countries? Good morning, everyone. The latest report from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, shows Canada is doing relatively well, performing better than average on 75% of health status indicators. I think Canadians might be surprised regarding how Canada performs on many of these indicators. Compared to the OECD average, Canada is doing better than most when it comes to life expectancy, which is about 82. Far more people over 65 are in good health. Smoking rates are lower. More Canadians are eating fruits and vegetables. And the vast majority of people who break their hip have surgery within two days. I think is a milestone to say, here's where you're doing really well. Here's where you have some problems. Compared to the OECD average, problems include diabetes is more prevalent, the number of opioid deaths are much higher, and when it comes to access to care, on average, Canadians are less satisfied. Then the question is, well, does that require spending more, or does it require spending differently? Canada is spending more on health than the OECD average, but not as much as other governments, including the UK and Germany. Canada also has fewer practicing physicians per 1,000 people than both countries, which includes family doctors and specialists contributing to a lack of access or appointments and frustrating wait times for scheduled surgeries. Workforce is a top priority for health system strengthening. Provincial and territorial leaders are promising changes and more collaboration, but experts say there are no quick fixes for health care and training more doctors will take time. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. And that opioid crisis Christine mentioned has also left many survivors who now live with chronic health issues. When I went to stand back up again, I couldn't stand up straight and it's been there ever since. Why so many aren't getting the help they need, next. Plus, the beetle that could save forests in Nova Scotia. This beetle is, is very important at holding back hemlock willi adelgid. The invasive species it's being brought in to fight. And later, a mysterious visitor in the night caught on tape. It was probably 1.30 in the morning and just the doorbell rang. The mouse that tried to get in the old-fashioned way. We're back in two years. It is mindful of a legacy of service and devotion to this country set by my beloved mother, the late Queen, that I deliver this, the first King's speech, in over 70 years. As he just said, that is King Charles delivering his first speech to Parliament as monarch, marking the start of the parliamentary year. He laid out British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's government agenda to reduce climate change and grow the UK economy. More than 38,000 Canadians have died from opioid overdose since 2016, but many more survived and now live with injuries. And as Yvette Bren tells us, medical experts say research on how to support them is way behind. Eh? What's the matter? Eh? You miss me? Hugh Lampkin began using drugs from pot to PCP to escape when he was about 12 years old, growing up in Toronto. You know, you got to walk a mile in a man's shoes to know exactly what, what's going through his head. Years of using drugs helped deal with memories of abuse. I didn't get any joy, but I would get comfort. Like, I was able to cope and, and deal with things. But a year and a half ago, he had a bad fall. When I went to stand back up again, I couldn't stand up straight, and it's been there ever since. He's one of thousands of Canadians with chronic health issues related to past opioid abuse or overdoses. 
According to the Canadian Institute of Health Information, in 2022 to 2023, there were close to 6,000 Canadian overdoses and 327 left people with anoxic brain injuries or brain damage due to a lack of oxygen. Some who don't overdose end up with infections which can lead to damage of organs or bones. If it spreads to the bones causing an infection called osteomyelitis, it will cause the bones to collapse so that people will have collapsed spines, not be able to stand up straight, not be able to walk properly. Injections can introduce infections. These can spread, causing abscesses or sores. Lesions from drug use can be aggressive and lead to amputations. This is, this is the office, uh, my desk. Experts say more study is needed to help people like you heal and rehabilitate. And I went to see a specialist about two weeks ago and he came out of the room and when he came out of the room I knew I just knew by his face that they were going to say no and he was saying the reason that they're not going to operate is because when I was younger I was doing drugs. Many aren't considered for organ transplants or complex surgeries like Hugh who no longer uses drugs but he says he has so much more to give to help others escape addiction. Yvette Bren, CBC News, Vancouver. Nova Scotia is struggling to deal with an invasive pest that could wipe out entire forests. It can move around via birds. That's probably how it got to Nova Scotia. The little beetle they hope will give them a fighting chance. Plus, since the war began a month ago, support for Hamas has only grown stronger. They have never been as violent as this time. Margaret Evans looks at its increasing popularity in the West Bank. And the ghosts of October 7th still haunt. The Hamas just wanted to kill everyone they saw. Ellen Morrow speaks with survivors of the massacre. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. You are looking at a cluster of stars the European Space Agency says are some of the oldest objects in the universe. This is part of a series of images released today from its Euclid telescope, the first since it launched in July. The goal is to create the most extensive 3D map of the universe yet and to help scientists unlock the secrets of dark matter. Some BC beetles here on Earth are settling into their new home on the other side of the country. Nova Scotia is hoping they will help protect hemlock trees from a scourge that's threatening to wipe them out. Kayla Hounsel shows us how. They're tiny, really tiny, but scientists are hoping they're the solution to a big problem. We think they're probably our best bet. The best bet against an invasive insect that is killing Nova Scotia's hemlock trees. Hemlock woolly adelgid, or HWA, was discovered in the province in 2017. It can move around via birds. That's probably how it got to Nova Scotia. It's rapidly spreading across the province and is now on nearly all of the thousands of hemlocks in Kejimakujik National Park. Little vampires sucking the tree. HWA is on the west coast too, but it's not a problem there because BC is home to this beetle, which eats the invasive insects. So we've established that, that indeed this beetle is, is very important at holding back hemlock woolly adelgid and that therefore it's an ideal candidate for helping control hemlock woolly adelgid elsewhere. So they're literally shaking the predators out of the trees and shipping them across the country. Yep, there's one right there. 3,600 have now arrived in Nova Scotia, leading to this moment, release. It's incredible. I mean, it's a really, really good feeling because, um, yeah, it can feel hopeless. This is the first time this kind of biocontrol has ever been used here in Canada. But these beetles have been used to battle these invasive insects in the United States for more than 20 years. One of them is already eating an HWA. How do you know it's only going to eat what you want it to eat? So that's, that's a very important question. This beetle only develops on HWA. It doesn't develop on anything else. The hope is that the beetles self-replicate to help protect these majestic trees hundreds of years old. Scientists are also treating some with pesticides. If left untreated, they expect 90% of Nova Scotia's hemlocks will die. The question now is whether the beetles 
and survive an East Coast winter. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, in Kejimakujik National Park. Now, let's go deeper into the story shaping our world. One month after Hamas's brutal attack on a music festival, a haunting pile of burnt-out cars draws Israelis to tell their stories of that day. But first, as Palestinians endure under brutal conditions, the impact is stirring others outside Gaza. This is The Breakdown. A snapshot of the West Bank shows why Hamas is gaining support. This is pro-Hamas graffiti. Some Palestinians say their conflicts with Israelis are worse than ever. They're smashing the glass. They have never been as violent as this time. He told me, you are all Hamas. Some are sick and tired of waiting for peace. All Palestinian factions have to come together and say enough is enough. From well before the start of this war, the point has been made that Hamas is distinct from the Palestinian people. Margaret Evans, our senior international correspondent, breaks down the forces, pushing them together, and not just in Gaza. Ramallah in the occupied West Bank and a mosque full to overflowing. At times of trouble, people turn to prayer, and these are troubled times. The sermon is an angry one, full of outrage over the plight of Palestinians in Gaza and calling for Israel's destruction. It pours easily into the streets, turning into a pro-Hamas rally, begging the question, is support for the militant group in charge of Gaza only growing? Your movement, Hamas, they're shouting. Your army, Al-Qassam. The people want the Qassam brigades. That's the Hamas military wing behind the brutal October 7th attacks that killed more than 1,400 Israelis. Hamza, 28, is one of the few demonstrators willing to speak to us on camera, but he's evasive about directly voicing support for Hamas. I was praying, and then I saw a demonstration, he says, and it's only natural that I joined it. Whatever was chanted at the demonstration is the message. As Israel continues a war it says is aimed at Hamas, few here accept that distinction, given the number of Palestinian civilians dying. Bombing women and children bombing hospitals, killing the Palestinian people and the identity is not about uh, chasing a specific party, it's about chasing the entire people of Palestine. Sabri Saidam is a senior leader with Fatah, the secular party that runs the West Bank's Palestinian Authority and Hamas's long-term political rival. He's marching for an end to Israeli attacks in Gaza, not in support of Hamas, but he does say it's time for Palestinian unity all Palestinian factions have to come together and turn to the international community and say enough is enough. Had this conflict been resolved decades ago, we would not have seen the wars, successive wars that we have seen over the years that have passed. The creation of the Palestinian Authority with civil control over some parts of the West Bank was an essential part of the 1990s Oslo Peace Accords, signed on to by the then Fatah leader Yasser Arafat. But the failure of that peace to materialize has left support for the PA and its Fatah leadership as singed as Arafat's mural, seen as weak in the face of an Israeli occupation now in its 56th year. Gaza's Hamas leaders clearly see space to try and extend their influence here. This is pro-Hamas graffiti. It's all along this street, which is in the center of Ramallah, which is, of course, headquarters for the Palestinian Authority. It wasn't here before October 7th. Support for Hamas, which doesn't recognize Israel's right to exist and is considered a terrorist organization by several Western governments, including Canada, isn't new in the West Bank. 
Israel regularly jails its supporters. And even before October 7th, the army had stepped up its raids on armed Palestinian factions in militant strongholds like Jenin. In the high hills north of Ramallah, sleepy-looking villages dot the landscape. Deir Hassana is centuries old and seemingly slow of pace. Two weeks ago, Israeli soldiers raided the home of Fadia Barghouti in the middle of the night, arresting her son, Basil. They have never been as violent. They haven't knocked or rang the bell. The only thing they started is smashing the glass. Barghouti's husband, Mahmoud, an accountant who works for the PA's Department of Religious Affairs, has been in administrative detention in an Israeli jail for 13 months now, not the first time he's been held without charge for supporting Hamas. She believes her son was arrested for backing a Hamas-linked party in student elections last spring. She says an Israeli intelligence officer threatened them. He put his nose on my nose, his eyes in my eyes, and he told me, you are all Hamas. You will all pay the price of what happened on the 7th of October. You know, they destroyed everything. Barghouti believes support for Hamas stems from the failure of the peace process and those naive enough to believe it could protect Palestinian rights. This world respects strong people. And you can't raise your voice, and this world can't hear you until you're, you're strong. You have something, power, in your hand. When Palestinians were weak, they smashed uh, us. I think resistance gave Palestinians um, a sense of dignity and a sense of power. Navigating West Bank roads has never been easy for Palestinians. A patchwork grid of Israeli army checkpoints and access roads for Jewish settlers, whose presence across the occupied territories continues to grow, despite condemnation from much of the international community. Violence towards Palestinians by ultra-nationalist settlers has surged in the wake of the Hamas attack, condemned by the White House. The Palestinian village of Kusra lies in the shadow of a settlement on one side and an outpost on the other, often manned by hardline settlers. Yeah, 19-year-old Rabia Ode and her mother were home when Jewish settlers attacked their house on the edge of Kusra four days after the Hamas assault. My brother tried to tell them we don't have any problems, but they suddenly attack us without anything. We, even we don't uh, take any rocks or stones and throw about him. Relatives and neighbors answered their calls for help. This video shows settlers opening fire. Ode's brother Awad was injured. Four other Palestinians were killed. Now Ode's family is too frightened to spend nights here. When they come in the day to clean up, they have their defenses ready. Settler violence may have spiked recently, but it's also not new. Ode's father was killed during a confrontation with settlers seven years ago now. Israel's current government includes extremist politicians who favor annexing the West Bank. Combined with current events, it leaves little room on the horizon for Palestinian hopes of statehood, more frayed than ever before. Udar Kassis heads Birzeit University's human rights program. He says a more radical landscape may well emerge from it all, not necessarily what most Palestinians want. But what is relevant eventually for the Palestinians is that what will make them free. Not Hamas, not the Palestinian Authority, not Fatah, not the third way, not the left, not the right. Whatever, will, whatever gives them the hope of freedom is what, is, is what will get relevance for Palestinians. So, Margaret, do you have a sense from the people you spoke to there who they think their next leaders might be? Well, there's a real sense that there has to be a turning of the page. There have to be 
elections after 17 years without. But of course, it's going to depend on what happens with this conflict, whether we're going to see a rise in radicalism, whether diplomacy will still be alive, whether there's an avenue for diplomacy. And if there is, I think you're going to find the next generation, a lot of young Palestinians just not trusting it. There's a lot of talk about grassroots populism. We've seen some of that uh, take root in East Jerusalem. And there's a lot of talk about a third way. So uh, one of the things I'm curious about is that so much of the world's focus ha has been on the conflict. Do people talk about the level of outside interest? Yeah, very much so. Um, and they make a, a differentiation between uh, how, how governments are seeing what's happening and what they're saying about it and what people are saying on the streets. They're very much aware of these large demonstrations taking place around the world calling for a ceasefire. Um, they see it as a recognition of, uh, of Palestinian aspirations that they say they haven't seen in a long time. I spoke to, to one man who, uh, a longtime advocate of the two state, st state solution, saying that what was happening now was actually the first thing in a long time that's given him hope because it is putting the Palestinian struggle for nationhood back on the agenda. All right, Margaret Evans, as always, thank you. Coming up one month after the Hamas attacks on Israel, the trauma is still fresh and fear still grips those who survived. I don't want to scare anymore, not there and not in my house. Helen Morrow speaks with survivors still looking for answers next. These scorched shells are the scars of a massacre. The Hamas just wanted to kill everyone they saw. In a field in southern Israel, investigators combed through hundreds of these husks. Are you getting anything from inside the car? But for a man who lost a dear friend, they only stir visions of horror. With his mom in the phone, hey mom, I love you, I love you, hey mom, it's done. One month after the murderous Hamas attack at a music festival, Ellen Morrow met with Israelis who went to retrieve belongings. What they may never again regain, they say, is sympathy for the other side. <laughs> The smell of death hangs in the air here. The burned out remnants of hundreds of cars destroyed in the Hamas attacks of October 7th. Some lit on fire, investigators say, with their passengers still inside. The brutality of that day one month ago. I saw all the vehicles scattered on the roads. I heard the shouting and the crying, Haim Ormazgin tells me. The cries are not forgotten. Ormazgin is with Zaka, a volunteer organization charged with collecting the remains of the dead. They look for blood, tissue samples, helping the police and forensics teams to identify who these cars belonged to. There are people we still don't know where they are and if they are alive or not. Like so many here, Haim is completely traumatized. I collected over 600 bodies in my own hands, he says. I saw severed heads, severed fingers. The silence here today symbolizes so much suffering. Many of the cars came from the attack on the Nova Music Festival. Hamas militants storming the festival grounds, killing hundreds of young people, abducting many others. The personal possessions left behind for a day out in the sun with friends are haunting. My friend uh, was with my car, with uh, three more people. Uh, one stayed there, he's not alive. So Itamar Dahari survived, but his friend Aliyah didn't. Aliyah was shot by Hamas while trying to escape on the phone with his mother as he ran. He's done with his, uh, with his mom in the phone. Hey, mom, I love you. I love you. Hey, mom. It's done. And uh, all this fucking shit, you know. This was the car Aliyah was driving. 
Itamar was with other friends that day. Still, he feels guilty. And because I don't was there uh, in the, the real time to take him out, to, to help him, to, to be with him because he's feel alone. And still more destroyed vehicles have just been brought to this lot. These come from near Oz. Almost half of its residents killed or taken hostage. One of the many kibbutzim stormed by militants. This lot tells so much of the story of October 7th because along with all of the destroyed vehicles, you also have this pile of motorcycles and these trucks that were used by Hamas during the attacks. They're kept as far away from the others as possible at the far end of the dirt field. This truck has what looks to be a machine gun position. You know, it feels like a Holocaust, a modern Holocaust, that the Hamas just wanted to kill everyone they saw. Hila Elimelech and Noi Ninio came here to get belongings for their friend, too emotionally scarred to come himself. Yeah, I grabbed his uh, girlfriend bag with her stuff. He's alive, but he can uh, come here. How do you feel seeing all these cars? Shocked. Yeah, I can't uh, imagine what happened to the people at the festival. I can't think about it. Smoke hangs over Gaza, just about five kilometers away from here. Outgoing artillery fire booms, reminders of the war and untold suffering triggered by this attack. Cut. Itamar backs Israel's fight, his heart hardened. We just wait for the end for to know that Gaza is not here anymore. Don't want to scare anymore, not there and not in my house and not in another country, no. As Haim works to identify the missing, it's the loss of so many children that hits him the hardest. He carries a balloon to a vehicle with a car seat, hoping the child who once sat there is still alive. Even as hope here can be hard to hang on to. Ellen, what a, what a haunting place that is. I'm curious what was going through your mind when you were there. Yeah, haunting is right, Adrian. It was really staggering to see row after row after row of these decimated cars, to see the bullet holes in some of them, the grenade impacts in some of them, to try to imagine what it might have been like to be there on that day. Uh, it was the personal items in the cars. You know, I saw this beautiful blue scarf hanging out of one of the windows, sunglasses. We saw a bag of trail mix. I saw someone's, you know, chicken scratch uh, on a notebook in a car, the signs of these lives lived. It was also hearing, you know, the deep pain, the trauma, the anger from the people who we spoke with and hearing the artillery fire, those heavy booms every few minutes of artillery fire going into Gaza, knowing there's so much pain there as well and so much more to come as Israel's military operation continues to intensify. All right, Ellen, big thanks to you and the team in Ashkelon tonight. You're welcome. We have more ahead after the break. Our moment is coming up next. It's a lovely one. Stick around. Boy, this little guy must have really wanted to come inside because he rang the doorbell at a Nova Scotia home, not once, but twice, at 1.30 in the morning. Also, I don't know how it's a he. Anyway, the couple inside were woken up, but unbothered by the doorbell, which, like any good Canadian doorbell, apparently plays the Hockey Night in Canada theme song, of course. The tiny late-night visitor is our moment. It was a mouse. Well, we were asleep. It was probably 1.30 in the morning, and the doorbell rang. It actually woke us up. My wife kind of looked at the camera, and she went back to sleep, so I didn't think anything of it. And then about two minutes later, it happened again. My wife had said this morning, did you look at the cameras to see uh, who rang the doorbell last night? And I said, no. And she said, check it out. It was a mouse. I was kind of shocked. The mouse was uh, running along the brick ledge, and stood up and actually put both paws on the doorbell and pushed the doorbell button. You know, you're just getting back to sleep and then the, the mouse wakes you up again. So I think this guy was trying to get into somewhere warm. <laughs> trying different methods. Yeah. yeah, trying to ring the doorbell, see if it'll open the door. What are you going to do about that? 
Uh, mice, mice tend to repeat behaviors, don't they? Uh, well, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. and see what happens, and if it happens again, we'll have to deal with it. So. <laughs> yeah. I really like this little guy. I mean, any rodent I've had the displeasure of encountering doesn't ask to come in, just sort of shows up. Also, uh, the theme song? I, I have so many questions. For all of us here at The National, uh, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrienne Arsenault. Take care.